Hello, I'm Peter Morgan, librarian at the Hamlin Midway Library in St. Paul, Minnesota. This is our 27th year of hosting the Fireside Reading Series, and we are thrilled to be able to carry on the tradition even in this unusual year. I am pleased to welcome you to the Fireside Reading Series from our fireside. If you are here, we would love to offer you cookies and coffee or tea. We'd all squeeze into our children's area for the evening and listen to great writers read from their books and talk with them about their work. Obviously, this year is different, and we are happy that you have chosen to join us in this new format to carry on our long tradition. Tonight, we are happy to feature Tell Me Your Names and I Will Testify, Essays by Carolyn Holbrook. The St. Paul Public Libraries have copies of our featured author's work available for contactless hold pickup at the Hamlin Midway Library or via Library Express at other library locations. You can find all the details on our website at www.sppl.org. I hope you are cozy wherever you are and that you enjoy tonight's event. Thank you for joining us. Hello, everyone. I am glad to welcome you this evening. Thanks to Peter for setting the scene. I'm Wendy Worden, Programs and Services Assistant at the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library, and I'm happy to be here with you tonight. Um, as we get started this evening, we would like to take a moment to acknowledge the Dakota people, indigenous keepers of the land from which I broadcast tonight. This land was reserved by the Dakota in the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux, signed with the United States in 1851, and it remains sacred to them today. We also acknowledge the Ojibwe people, fellow indigenous inhabitants of this land. The Dakota and Ojibwe people are the original stewards of stories in this place now called Minnesota, and we at the Friends honor that tradition and the knowledge and values embedded in it as we work to lift up storytellers in our state today. Our main event this evening features Carolyn Holbrook, and she is just been listed as one of the finalists for the uh, Minnesota Book Awards in the memoir and creative nonfiction category. And we're very, very happy to have her with us tonight. Uh, this event is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Carolyn Holbrook is a writer, educator, and longtime advocate for the healing power of the arts. She is the author of the essay collection she will read from this evening. She's the co-author of Minnesota civil rights icon, Dr. Josie R. Johnson's memoir, Hope in the Struggle. Her personal essays have been published widely, most recently in A Good Time for the Truth, Race in Minnesota, and Blue's Vision. She is the recipient of three Minnesota State Arts Board grants and an MRAC Next Step grant. She is the founder and artistic executive director of More Than a Single Story, for which she won a Minnesota Women's Press Changemaker Award in 2015, and was the founder and director of Sassy The Right Place, which was one of my very first places to experience Minnesota Lit when I was a college student. She teaches creative writing at the Loft Literary Center, Hamlin University, and other community venues. Welcome, Carolyn. So good to see you tonight. Thank you, Wendy. It's good to see you, too. I did not know that you knew about uh, Sassy when you were in college. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was, I, I was a, a Hamlin student twice. So. <laughs> oh, how about that? OK. Well, um, hand it over to your reading. All right. Thanks everyone for coming and thank you, Wendy, for, for having me. <laughs> thank you, friends of the St. Paul Library. So um, just a little bit about my book, Tell Me Your Names and I Will Testify. Um, I've been working on this book since the early 1980s when my children were teenagers. Um, it all started with writing about the funny things they did and said in an effort to try to stay sane because I was recently divorced and, you know, it was kind of shocking every day to find myself a single mother with five children to raise. So I figured, well, one, one way through it is to just think about the funny things that they do. And um, it really did help. Um, 
And so I just kept writing, just kept writing the essays for years and years. And then um, for a long time, I thought the book would just be a chronological memoir. But, you know, as I kept working on the essays that appear in the book, um, I couldn't figure out how to put them together into a logical sequence. So several years ago, while I was putting together a pitch for, for the Lofts Pitch Conference, my writing buddy, Diane Wilson, described my, my manuscript as a memoir in connected essays. And that's exactly what it is. So suddenly I sort of realized that, that um, that's what I had been working on all these years. Thankfully, my editor agreed. Um, and many readers have told me that this structure works really well for them because they don't have to follow a traje trajectory from beginning to end. They can just pick up any essay and read it and you know, still be, um, you know, not lose track of what's going on. Um, and then, you know, when we started working on, on, you know, turning these essays into a manuscript, um, I had to take a look at the older ones from the point of view of how do I see the, how do I see it now, as opposed to when, you know, whatever I was writing about was going on. So that was a really interesting exercise. And I would recommend it for anyone who's, um, you know, looking back at things that they wrote some time ago, you know, there is a then and now aspect that's um, really interesting and important to take a look at. Uh, many people have also asked about the title of my book. Um, it begins with an epigraph, which is a section of a long poem by Lucille Clifton in which she is visiting a cemetery on a plantation in South Carolina. And in the poem, she implores the unnamed slaves who are buried there to tell her their names so that she can testify on their behalf. So um, from there, I moved to a prologue where I tell the story of a visit from an ancestor who commands me to tell our story. So I took that to mean um, to tell, you know, parts of my family's story, but also to, um, testify on behalf of myself and to, you know, add my words to what's been writ written about certain aspects of the story of my people. Um, so what I'm going to read for you tonight are um, the first chapter, which is called My Roots, and then I'll read some excerpts from the second chapter, which I will, you know, explain as I get there. So, <clears throat> excuse me, My Roots. I was a small child when my parents divorced. My mother moved my three siblings and me from our home in Ann Arbor, Michigan to make a new life in Minneapolis and dad moved his new family to Springfield, Massachusetts. Life is never easy for a single parent and mama was no exception. I always bristle when I hear white feminists talk about work as a privilege. Black women have always had to work, often cleaning the houses of wealthy white women who were privileged to work outside their homes. In addition to cleaning houses, Mama also did piecework in a factory where she was paid according to the amount of work she produced. But even with two jobs, she had to resort to commodities such as government cheese and a spam-like meat substance in order to keep food on the table. Even so, she kept our house spotless, made our clothes, kept us clean, and nursed us through our childhood illnesses. She found creative ways to stretch that tasteless government food, often inventing dishes she hoped she, that we would enjoy, being sure to include healthy servings of fruit and fresh veg vegetables that she grew in the garden that she kept on the side of our home. And she spent a lot of time in the hot summers canning so the produce from her garden would last through the cold Minnesota winters. Like her mother before her, my mother wanted to be a hairstylist. Over time, she, she accomplished her dream in a much larger way than she envisioned when she was a young mother struggling to keep food on the table. She worked her way through beauty school and then went to work at Bee's Beauty Shop in South Minneapolis. Her struggle continued for a while, but things got easier after she met Barney. I was about 12 years old when Mama and Barney married and he brought his young son to live with us. A gentle and loving man, Barney was a terrific father and stepfather. He adored my mother and us children. Mama treated his sunlight as though he were her own child and we all accepted him as our brother. To this day, my children's faces brighten during frequent mentions of Grandpa Barney. In his professional life, Welton Barney Barnett was the first black auditor for the Minnesota Department of Agriculture, but his real passion was music. He picked his left-handed Fender Telecaster guitar in small combos and also 
with a big band that played in a ritzy suburban supper club called the White House. We kids loved watching him when he sat on the couch quietly practicing his amp with his amplifier turned off <clears throat> so as not to disturb the family. And we enjoyed dancing around in time to the music when his friends came over to practice in our basement. It was unfortunate that in keeping with the times, Bernie was forced to enter the supper club through the back door while his white bandmates went in through the front door. While I was preparing for an estate sale after Mama and Bernie passed away, I came across an obituary about him in an archived 1985 edition of Downbeat Magazine. There, for the first time, we children learned that he had played with jazz legends Cab Calloway and Duke Ellington in, in uh, his New York City heydays in the 40s. Mama and Barney had good heads for business, and together they opened Mama's own beauty salon, Joanna Salon of Beauty on 48th Street and 4th Avenue in South Minneapolis at a time when the practice of redlining limited Black folks to living and doing business in areas that were not as far south as that neighborhood. Later, after her first employer, B, passed away, they bought the building she owned and turned it into a beauty school. Career Beauty Academy was the first and only African-American beauty school to ever exist in the state of Minnesota. Unfortunately, they were unable to sustain it. It closed after five short years, but that did not stop my courageous mother. She opened another salon and accepted um, an invitation to start a cosmetology program in the Minneapolis Public Schools, a program that still exists at Edison High School. And when she was almost 60 years old, after she had owned and operated two beauty salons and the beauty school, and after she had started the program for the public schools, I proudly witnessed my amazing mother march across the stage of North, Northrop Auditorium at the University of Minnesota to acknowledge, excuse me, to accept the Bachelor of Science degree in vocational education she had earned. I come from a long line of role models, black women entrepreneurs and educators. My maternal grandmother developed and sold a line of hair products and taught her patrons how to use them. My great grandmother together with my great grandfather turned their home into a boarding house for African-American railroad porters in Lincoln, Nebraska where porters were not allowed to stay in hotels. I am proud to be the inheritor of my foremother's remarkable enterprising spirit. It is because of their legacy that I've been able to achieve as much as I have. And then I'm gonna read, um, <clears throat> excuse me, some, some excerpts from the next chapter called Coming Clean. As I mentioned, um, education is, it just sort of runs in my family's blood. And um, the way I came to teaching was a little different than, than um, my mother and probably a lot of other people. Um, my, <laughs> my youngest daughter, um, she was going to South High School and <clears throat> excuse me, she was late so often, like two or three times a week, I had to drive her to school and, you know, sign the pass to let her in. And one day the assistant principal asked me to step into her office. And I thought, oh my God, um, we're in trouble. But instead she said that she had noticed um, the relationship that I have with my daughter. And um, she said that there were a lot of young African-American girls at, at South High who could use a mentor. And she asked if I'd be willing to mentor one of them. But, you know, she didn't know that my daughter Ebony had just been through some really difficult times um, that I won't go into now because I, you know, because of time constraints. But um, I just didn't want to bring a, a, a strange girl into our house and, you know, upset her even more. So what I decided to do was, well, South had, and they still have, lots of different programs all the way from AP classes um, down to um, courses for students that are not doing so well in school. But they also had a program for teen parents and I had been a teen parent. My um, first child Stevie was born when I was 17. So I thought well maybe what I can do is offer creative writing class to Sorry, I accidentally muted myself. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the, assist the assistant principal liked that idea and so did the teacher in the program um, for teen parents. 
So um, I asked a friend of mine, Julie Landsman, to help me put together a program to teach these kids creative writing. So I'll start on the first day of the class. I'll start reading there, which is on page 13. One day, one of the girls cleared her throat <clears throat> and gave her glasses a gentle nudge to keep them from sliding down her nose. Uh, Miss Holbrook, she said, you're nice, but this is boring. No disrespect, but you don't know nothing about us. Why do you think you can come in here and help us by trying to make us write about things that don't mean nothing to us? Around the table, heads nodded in agreement, and I suddenly realized that it might to be professional and to a disappointing Ms. Rudell, who was the assistant principal. I had denied those young women and men the very thing that they needed from any adult who worked with them, to just be my authentic self, to just be real. <clears throat> so I made a split second decision to drop the lesson plan I had so carefully put together and to come clean, to show them that I knew more about them than they thought, that the reason I wanted to work with them was because I was one of them. I had my first child when I was 17. So I closed the page on the book of poems I had planned to use for that day's prompt and looked from one student to another, the light-skinned black girl who was unable to see her own beauty and with her partner, Corey, who adored her and their baby, the blonde girl whose seven month fetus bore down on her bladder, causing her to get up every few, few minutes to go to the restroom, which was thankfully located in the classroom, and then to the teacher who nodded slightly, wondering how I was gonna handle the situation. I wasn't one of the popular girls in school, I told the kids. And then I went on to say that I didn't wear pretty dresses or go to school dances like the Central High Prom or the swanky debutante ball that my sister Joanne went to. Nor was I surrounded by adoring boys like Joanne and her friends were. Secretly, I wanted to be like my sister but it simply wasn't in the cards for me. My personality wasn't the type that attracted popularity. Instead, my friends and I got into fights and talked back to our parents and teachers and the boys in our South Side neighborhood pretty much ignored us. My mother and stepfather were strict, but one thing my siblings and I were allowed to do without supervision was to take the bus downtown for Saturday afternoon matinees. My friends and I looked forward to those weekly excursions because a group of boys from the North Side Projects also went to those movies. It was 1961, and they reminded us of the gangs in West Side Story, the rough, sexy white boys we saw in reruns of James Dean's movies, and of Sidney Poitier, the gorgeous actor from the Bahamas who played Greg in Blackboard Jungle. And unlike the South Side boys, they liked us. Even though I wasn't a model teenager, I wanted my parents' approval after I started seeing this one boy from, from the projects. So I was sure that they would like him if only they could meet him. Boy, was I wrong. They made it unmistakably clear that they didn't want him coming around, nor did they want me to see him under any circumstances. But like teenagers since the beginning of time, whose parents tried to keep them apart, we found ways to be together. Um, then I go on to talk about you know the ways they how you know he would pick me up in the middle of the night and I would climb out my bedroom window and meet him. Um, okay, so Joanne, my sister is Joanne. Joanne and I had a pink princess phone that sat on the nightstand between our beds. Luckily, she always fell asleep first. <clears throat> so on the nights Lonnie was coming to call, I was able to slip under the covers with my clothes on and hide the phone under my pillow with no worry that she would hear it ring. Like clockwork, his call always came right before midnight. Ready, baby, he rasped, and then whispered as though he feared that Joanne would hear him. I'll be there in five minutes. My bed rested against the wall by our bedroom window, which made my next steps easy. I quietly placed the phone back in its cradle and returned to the nightstand, class, uh, glancing over to make sure Joanne was still sleeping. Then. I slowly opened the window and crawled out onto the slanted roof and closed it, leaving it open just a crack to ensure that I might be able to get back in. I jumped down from the roof and creep out into the alley where Lonnie was waiting. We never stayed out longer than an hour or two. I wanted to be sure I was back in bed in my pajamas before my family or our neighbors woke up. One night though, he, um, 
he said that he had been watching a small gas station that was open late. He said the guy there seemed kind of bored and, you know, he figured he could, you know, take him out essentially. Um, so he taught me how to drive his old two-tone Buick. And, you know, we went around and around in this parking lot in an empty lot. And then, um, then we drove to the gas station and we parked a few houses away. Then he got out, leaving the engine idling and he kissed me. He said, you know what to do. So I slid over to the driver's seat, heart pounding, shoulders tense, with sweaty palms gripping the steering wheel, I began to question what I was getting myself into. Sure, it was thrilling, but what if we got caught? Was jail as romantic as the movies made it seem? Was this boy worth it? I didn't have much time to wonder. Soon, a noise that sounded like popcorn popping came from the gas station, and Lonnie ran out holding a pistol. He jumped into the passenger seat, and I drove off. We didn't get very far before we heard sirens blaring and saw red and blue lights flashing on the rear view mirror. So now, you know, back to the kids in the classroom. Um, I mean, they, the young parents stared in amazement when I told them how that night resulted in my being sentenced to the Minnesota Homeschool for Girls in Sauk Center, about a hundred miles Northwest of Minneapolis. The doctor there soon discovered that I was three months pregnant. And because of the last, uh, because of the heart murmur I was born with, he sent me back to, Minas to Minneapolis to spend the remaining six months of my pregnancy incarcerated on the maternity ward at the University of Minnesota Hospital in a bland room with white walls, a cold linoleum floor and four beds. A steady stream of women came in with labor pains and left within a few days with their newborns. There were also long longer term patients, juvies like myself, and women who were there because of difficult medical problems. Um, tongues clucked and grunts gurgled from the students' throats when I told them that my mother and stepfather wouldn't let me bring my baby home. I had no choice but to put him in foster care or to give him up for adoption. I chose foster care. However, I was only allowed to see him once a week on Saturday afternoons, one hour at a time for the first 14 months of his life. And then um, I was awarded custody, and uh, but I hadn't had any um, any parenting classes, and so you know I let the kids know how fortunate they were to have these classes where they could learn um, parenting skills. I had to pretty much figure it out on my own because you know my parents really did not want you know me at home with this this un unwed mother thing. You know, oh man. So anyway. So I definitely had their attention now. And, um, you know, questions flowed one after the other, um, you know, most centering on how in the world I got to where I am today, where, you know, sitting in the classroom with them after all of the, you know, pressure that I had been through. Um, and so then uh, the mood changed and the kids started writing, you know, and every week got, it just got better and better. I'd still bring in prompts. And by then they were ready to, to try at least to write. And, um, but there was this one boy named Andy who showed up every single week, but never participated. He just sat there like a bump on a log, so to speak. And um, he just would not participate. Um, so anyway, let's see, let me start with Andy. Um, so as I mentioned, the, the class, you know, they were, it wasn't just the moms, there were boys there too. There were, you know, young, there were several young fathers who participated with their, um, with their daughter, with their um, children's mothers. So anyway, after that, okay, back to Andy. Sorry, I'm getting lost here. Okay. One of the young fathers in the class was a quiet, rather surly young man named Andy, who never wrote or participated in our discussions. <clears throat> he also never missed a class. Andy seemed more sullen than usual the day after then Speaker of the House Newt Gingrich announced the Republican right wing so-called contract with America, which among other things suggested that the nation could reduce the welfare roles by placing the children of welfare mothers in orphanages. The idea was to prohibit states from paying welfare benefits to children whose paternity was not established and also to the children who were born out of wedlock to women under 18 years of age. The savings, according to his proposal, 
would be used to establish and operate orphanages and group homes for unwed mothers. The morning Andy read about Gingrich, the Gingrich proposal, he sat planted in his seat, legs crossed, arms folded tightly across his chest, his thick blonde eyebrows furled in a deep, brow, deep frown and his lips glued together in a scowl, all making him look much older than his 17 years. Then in the middle of a writing exercise in which as usual, he had not participated, he suddenly blurted out, I'm tired of the way people like Newt Gingrich and the doctors and social workers treat us. I wanna write a letter to the editor. A brief silence came over the classroom, followed by agreement from the other students, all who had experienced offensive treatment by doctors and social workers and even some of their teachers. And Sue, um, the teacher in this program, joined in confirming that she could tell by a student's demeanor if they had come to class from an appointment or a class that hadn't gone well. And now Newt Gingrich and his moral majority were insulting them again by promoting a plan that would exacerbate the nearly unbearable restrictions that teen parents were already living under. For instance, for the few hundred dollars they received every month in a check and an electric benefit card to cover only the bare necessities, they had to spend inordinate amounts of time doing paperwork to continue proving uh, month after month that they were qualified, time that that ate into the hours that they could be caring for their children and completing their homework so they could prepare for self-sufficiency. <clears throat> Moved by their passion, I, also, I once again tossed out my lesson plan. I didn't have a clue how to teach anyone how to write a letter to an editor, but I knew someone who did. The previous summer, I had served as interim editor of the Whittier Globe, my neighborhood's newspaper, and had put together a series of community journalism workshops taught by seasoned feature writers, sports writers, food critics, and others. One of the journalists was Eric Ringham, then commentary editor of the Minneapolis Star Tribune. I called him and I was happily surprised that he agreed to come and visit the class because um, I thought he was just gonna give me a few pointers, but instead he came. And um, so he explained his work at the Star Tribune to the students and his expectations for their commentaries and told them that if they were willing to write commentaries about their lives as teen parents, he would publish them and pay each child a hundred bucks. Um, so after that, um, you know, during, during the time he was there, there was this young woman whose head was on her desk constantly. And um, he asked her, you know, just thinking that maybe she was just lazy or, um, or just being rude. And he asked her, you know, why, what, what's up with you? And she just said, I'm tired. And he asked her, why are you so tired? I overslept and missed my bus. So I walked to school, she replied with a yawn. No big deal, I'm guessing, he thought to himself. But he asked the next question anyway. How far do you live from school? 20 blocks. Now he was even more curious. Why didn't you just catch the city bus or stay home? She said, I didn't have any money and I, I need to get my education. A dumbfounded look came over his face. He stared at the girl for a moment and then asked when her baby was due. Next month, she replied and placed her head back on her desk. Later, he told me that those kids, especially that young mom who wanted her education so badly that she had walked 20 blocks to school in the eighth month of her pregnancy, changed his view of teen parents. Until then, he, like so many others, had bought into the myth that teenage Teenagers like them are just lazy and promiscuous, uninterested in educating themselves or their children. Um, the intelligence and the determination he witnessed that day caught him by surprise. So after that, um, <clears throat> the kids just really perked up and they started writing their uh, commentaries. And Andy, the young man, uh, just got totally involved in it. And he was really good with helping the kids um, you know, with workshopping, and he wrote a really awesome essay as well. And at the end of that project, Eric Ringham did publish their, their um, commentaries on September 17th, 1995. There it is. I'm still proud of it to this day. So I think I'm going to stop reading here. Um, if anyone has questions. <laughs> 
Yep, absolutely. Now is the, now is the time. Please please put your questions in the chat. Thank you, Carolyn, for for reading for reading from that section. I think it gives people a great sense of the the kind of of honesty that that flows through the whole book and, and that encapsulates your um, your teaching philosophies. And it's just it's just wonderful. And also, I enjoyed hearing about you as a as a kid getting out of your bedroom window and oh. that, was <laughs> <laughs> that I was not a model teenager by any stretch of the imagination. <laughs> um, while while the audience are formulating their oh hey we've got we've got Nancy asking what got you into writing in the first place? You loved your book. Thank you. What got me into writing is that um, I was the middle child in a very boisterous family and I was the quiet one and I never felt like anybody paid attention to me. Um, I'm sure they did, but I felt like they didn't. And so I just started writing because, you know, whatever I put on the page was mine, didn't talk back to me. And um, I felt like it was listening to me. And um, I've been writing ever since I was about five or six years old, I guess. Even yeah, when yeah. I was a, a, a bratty teenager. That, have you journaled that whole time as as well? Because I, I I find that really really admirable. I, I just I can't keep a journal practice to save my life. <laughs> I have to talk about that because I have some prompts. Yeah. I actually love teaching journaling. <laughs> yeah, do it. Tell us about journaling. Well, um, oh my gosh, look at all these names, Mimi and John. John Stalin. My gosh, I haven't seen you in a million years. Um, um, yeah. Uh, I have, you know, several prompts that I use during a journaling workshop to try to get people to understand that there's many different ways to use a journal. Um, and, you know, sometimes people just need a, some, some way to jumpstart it or to invite themselves, you know, into journal, a journaling practice rather than it feeling like a chore. Yeah, so, yeah, that's why I use lots of different ways to do that. Um, and I'm with, I'm with Marsha on this one, who says your book is so easy to follow, even though it does jump around chronologically. And I also felt, Wendy speaking, you know, that it had an arc to it. And if you could speak maybe to the, the construction of, of the book a bit, that would be great. Well, let's see, I'll try to be halfway intelligent here. Um, um, <laughs> it does sort of, it, it does sort of go from, um, you know, my early years through, uh, you know, much later in life. Um, but it, when we decided to put it together, I mean, there are lots of essays, lots of essays and journal entries and things that didn't make it into the book. Um, and, you know, we, we just decided that, you know, to structure it so that it does follow some sort of traje trajectory, even though it can still be read in, in spurts and jumps and, um, you know, different uh, chapters at any time, different essays. Um, I, I don't know if I'm making any sense or answering your question, um, but yeah, we tried to put it together so that um, it did sort of, that it wasn't necessarily chronological, but did follow some sort of order so that, you know, if you did read it from, cover to cover, you could follow it. And yet, if you chose not to, you could still follow it. Does that make sense at all? <laughs> yes, yes, it does. I works, works for me. Um, Mimi is congratulating you on, on being you, perhaps, also, which I, <laughs> she says, you've created so many services. What projects are you into now? I am actually working on a novel now. Um, one of the classes that I teach at Hamlin and also at the Loft at different times is called Turning Life into Fiction. And, um, you know, there are parts of my life that I have wanted to write about, but just, you know, didn't have the, didn't just, you know, really couldn't. And so I decided, well, I think I'm gonna see what happens if I try to fictionalize it. And I'm actually kind of blown away by what's happening with the fiction. 
um, you know, it started, um, you know, from, from a story um, that I wanted to write about. And now it's just taken off in this direction that, that I, I just can't believe. And, you know, the characters in the book are wanting to talk and I'm, I'm letting them and listening to what they have to say. And it's like, wow, I had no idea this was going, <laughs> it was fun. It, I, I should say it is fun. I'm, I'm only on chapter two now I've done. Yeah, but I mean, just the, the thoughts that are coming into my head at all hours of the day and night and I'm writing them down and thinking about them and trying to figure them out. And it's just like, wow, it's, I'm loving it. I have, I have fiction envy, like that <laughs> sounds fantastic. <laughs> John um, asking if, if any of the essays in the book um, anticipate or maybe reflect uh, the violence experienced by incidents from George Floyd to so many other victims. Yes and no, not by name. Um, the novel will more than the book of essays. And that's something else. A lot of people don't know um, that, you know, for a publisher, well, most publishers, there are some that are faster than that, but for most publishers, it takes a while to, you know, from the time that you um, start talking with your editor to the time that the book is actually published. And when we decided on the publication date for this book it was a year before the pandemic and George Floyd happened. And it just happened to come out at the right time. We had no idea. And it's very, very timely in that way. Um, but we didn't plan it that way at all. Um, the other thing I'm working on with more than a single story, which is my little organization where we have panel discussions and writing workshops on all different kinds of topics that are pertinent to the various communities of color. We are putting out an anthology in the fall, um, which kind of covers the first five years. Well, we thought it was going to cover the first five years of more than a single story. We're into our moving into our sixth, almost seventh year now. And so we thought that it was going to reflect those five years. And then the pandemic happened. And so we told the writers, you know, if you want to write about that, it's fine. We're not going to tell you not to. And then George Floyd happened. And we thought, oh my God, you know, wow, what is going on here? So we told people the same thing. You know, you want to write about the conditions that we're living in today. That is fine. So some people, the, the anthology has pieces that you know relate directly to the unrest after George Floyd, directly to the murder of black people, directly to the pandemic, but also other topics as well. So um, yeah, we just finished putting together all of the, I think there's 26 um, pieces um, within those, I think there are five or six points, but most are essays and trying to put it together so that it makes sense, you know, considering the, the breadth of, you know, work that has come in. But you'll be seeing that in October slash November. That's very exciting. I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, me too. Such a good collection of, of voices in, the, in, the, in this area to draw from. So you've yes. been so good at at lifting those those voices up, so it's very it's great it's exciting. <laughs> um, Kate asking, how do you think we can encourage young people to participate in writing programs? We need to have their perspective on so many topics. We certainly do need to have their perspective, and I think that there are um, programs and and um, organizations that are doing that. We need to have. I don't, I'm hoping that there's a lot of writing going on in schools. Um, Debbie Meister, my goodness, I haven't seen you in a million years either, hi. Um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, today's kids are more familiar with poetry um, and spoken word than they were when we started at Sassy in 1993. Um, <clears throat> And so I think, you know, and, and really amplifying voices like Amanda Gorman right now is very encouraging, I think, for kids. And also um, 
because there's so much going on with True Art Speaks and um, other organizations that are working with young people. Um, Mimi, you've been working with young people since time began. I'm sorry, I'm probably older than you, so don't be insulted by that. But um, yeah, I think that we just need to just keep listening to them and allowing them to speak, not censoring their thoughts or letting them feel like like what they have to say is not valid because it totally is. What do I do for myself to keep healthy and positive? I take a lot of naps. <laughs> yeah. And I have a glass of red wine at night, which I will do as soon as we're done with this. <laughs> oh, so long brought her wine to the event. I think maybe you could have done this. <laughs> Yeah. You could have done. <laughs> I have you shouldn't yeah. it's full of plasticky junk, but you know. my grandmama also swore by the single glass of wine, and I am now the keeper of the tiny glass in which she had her glass of wine every night. <laughs> so. it's pretty amazing. It's pretty amazing what it can do to you know to get you settled in after a long stressful day. Or not so stressful day. Yeah. 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 Huh. <laughs> Uh, Tracy's question is great about uh, advice you might give to poets wanting to write essays. Um, is, do you have a, an idea, ideas on narrative approach um, for essay writing and how it relates to, to poetry? A couple of thoughts. Um, you know, a, a lot of you know that we live in an amazing literary universe here in the Twin Cities. We have the most vibrant literary community between the two coasts, and that ain't no joke. It's been proven. That said, um, we have lots of um, classes you can take at the loft and community centers. We offer things, you know, with our programs through more than a single story, which we'll be doing one again with uh, Friends of the St. Paul in the fall. Um, but there's, yeah, and then there's plenty of books. Uh, I think Natalie Goldberg's book is still relevant. Um, Writing Down the Bones is still really relevant. Um, and, you know, um, people come to my classes sometimes with, with the question that you, that you have. And we just end up talking about, well, what is it that you're writing about? What is it you want to say? You know, because there's a million and 59 different ways to say it. And if you have a poet's voice, it's still gonna come through in an essay. You still hear the music in the essay. And I'm going off on a tangent now because I just love just, you know, when I'm reading something that has musicality, whether it's an essay or a poem, oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> These are the tangents we welcome because I am a giant language nerd. And so I love to hear smart people talk about their love of these things. <laughs> Uh, I'm glad you think I'm a smart peep. <laughs> you are. You're one of my favorites. For the audience, Carolyn and I have a Hamlin history, so that's why I'm a bit, I'm a bit informal this evening. <sighs> Peter wants to know if you still sneak out to Saturday matinee. <laughs> this is relayed through Nancy Carlson. <laughs> Some afternoons, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had to sneak out when my kids were teenagers when I was trying to date, but uh, yeah. Oh, but the goodness. answer quick and dirty is yes. <laughs> oh, we just mentioned Natalie Goldberg, so that's that's good, that's good. Do you still speak to to high school classes about about writing topics? And I mean, I know you're out there in the community all the time, but yeah, and with this Zoom stuff, um, it's a different way to speak to classes. But yes, we've um, actually have a couple of ne next week, <laughs> and yeah. then yeah, yeah. Interestingly, someone asked me. Um, to record a couple of the pieces in my book for her high school class because she, you know, she 
couldn't, you know, put together a, a dialogue with me and the kids. So yeah, okay, what the heck, why not? Maybe she'll figure out how to do that. Yeah. Anything works right now, I think. That's one I of agree. the I agree. upsides I agree. of this this format. <laughs> um, Annette has asked, I'm intrigued by the way your spirituality comes out in your writing. Can you speak more um, more to this or maybe how, how you decided to do that in, in the book? It's sort of like... Um... It's just a part of me um, and my own personal spiritual path just lives with me all the time. You know, whether it's um, ancestors coming to visit me or, you know, my own kind of stuff. And I always sort of go back to an interview I heard with Isabel Allende. Um, it was on NPR actually. And somebody asked her how do you um, include the politics in your writing so seamlessly? And, you know, if you know Isabella Allende, she writes fiction and memoir, both. And they both just sort of, I mean, it's just full of just amazing stories, but, you know, the politics in her country um, always find their way in. And she says, I don't think about it. I just tell my story. And I think that's what I do, you know, in terms of including spirituality in my work. It's just such a part of me that I, I, you know, sometimes I don't even know I'm doing it. Then I look back and say, oh, well, yeah, I guess I'll keep that. <laughs> yeah. It, it comes, it comes through uh, it very, very authentically. And I think that's, mm -hmm. that's valuable in, I mean, in, in any, any piece of, of writing, you can tell when someone is just being themselves, and I and I appreciate that about about your work. Thanks, Wendy. <laughs> um, <laughs> sounds like your parents were right about Lonnie. Ooh, do you ever think about if you ever or, or do you ever think about as you raised your own children what might have what they might have done differently to being your parents? Sorry, there's a lot of. So what your parents might have done differently to encourage you towards something or someone else? I think what they could have done is the thing that that parents often don't do in situations like that. I mean, they should have let me see him. Then I probably would have seen him and got tired of him real quick. But they said no. And the more they said no, the more I said yes. You know what I mean? So people, I mean, just remember Romeo and Juliet. It's been going on since the beginning of time when parents tell teenagers not to see each other. I mean, they're gonna do exactly what you tell them not to do. So if they had tried to embrace him, oh my God, I can't even imagine that. But if they had tried to em embrace him or just accept you know, that I was seeing him, I probably would have gotten so tired of him within three weeks or less. That's what I think. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. We've had a couple of, of questions. I like to wrap with the, with the, with the fun here. So um, all of this has been fun, but we've got a couple questions about who are you reading now, your favorite book of all time, memoirs you would recommend. So kind of what are, what are you enjoying in the, in the book world and what have you enjoyed? I just finished reading Ocean Vong's um, uh, autobiographical novel on Earth. We are gorgeous. What, what is the title? Uh, yeah. It's yeah. Behind me. I should be to roll across my room right now. Yeah, I think it's on Earth. We are briefly gorgeous. Yeah, on Earth we are briefly gorgeous. Because I'm really, really fascinated right now by um, by autofiction. But you know, because I, I think what I'm writing is autobiographical fiction. And so I'm sort of going back and looking at some like Tim O'Brien's work, um, even though it's about the Vietnam War and I don't wanna hear any more about the Vietnam War, I'm interested in how he did that book. It's definitely autobiographical fiction. I'm, I'm really fascinated by that, by that form right now. Um, um, and I'm also interested in um, 
I'm going back and reading, or, or if you're familiar with The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, um, Scorpio on the Cusp. I'm a Scorpio on the Cusp too. Hey, I just saw that come up. Um, I don't know which cusp you're on. I'm on the Libra Scorpio cusp. But um, I'm, you know, because my novel, I want, I really want it to talk about the horrific things that have happened to black women and girls. Um, and so I'm sort of, you know, sort of looking at things that have happened to black women. And for some reason, Henrietta Lacks just popped into my head when I started, when I first started the novel. And um, if you don't know about her, it's easy to find. Just look up Henrietta Lacks or look up the HeLa cells, H-E-L-A, and see what the medical community has done to us. Um, and I'm really fascinated by, by those stories and, you know, and trying to, trying to figure out, you know, how to tell them without it sounding like, um, you know, overused stuff and to make it still sound fresh. And so my protagonist is 26 and um, what happened in her life happened when she was 12. So she's going back and forth and other women in her, in her life are talking, her aunt, um, her mother who has passed away, she comes back and talks. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm sort of looking at, at things like that. You have any suggestions? Pop them in the chat. I'd love to know. Yeah, I, that I, I remember shortly after the, the, the nonfiction book, the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks came out. I read that and I just like, I dove down this rabbit hole that didn't quit because it was so, <laughs> yeah. It was, it was an eye-opening experience for this uh, still somewhat naive lady, I think. Also, oh, somebody put Silent Spring. Let me see yeah. what that is. Um, I, I would really love to to get um, to get your perspective, Carolyn, on, on Scorpio on the cusps <laughs> question about when it's appropriate to consider audience or, or readership, or is that something you let your editor and publisher worry about? A little bit of both. I think that there's a long, 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 long road between writing and publishing. And I think that when you're writing, you should not censor yourself, say what you need to say, get it out of your body, out of your mind, out of your heart, out of your being. When it's time to start considering publishing, then that's when I think you should consider audience. Um, and I think most publishers well, I shouldn't say most, I should say my publisher and others that I know are close friends of mine who are publishing. Your publisher does have this way of, um, I mean, they have a questionnaire actually that helps you consider who your book should be marketed to, who the audience, the audience or audiences um, might be most appropriate or more interested in what you're writing. But until then, I just really tell students all the time, whether they're, um, you know, um, intro to creative writing students or master's level students or whatever, tell your damn story and then worry about, you know, audience when you get ready to publish it. Because you know, there's another thing here too. And that is that you don't know who's gonna read your book. You have no idea. Um, and you don't know how they're going to accept it or hear it. Um, so you might as well just tell your story. Whether that made sense or not, I don't know. No, nope, that, is, that is the place. That is like wrap it. There it is. Like just tell your damn story, and I'm gonna I'm gonna file that one. <laughs> that's my that's my thing. I'm carrying with me this week from from this conversation, Carolyn. So I I I have, I have appreciated your time this evening, audience. Thank you so much, as always, for your attention. Um, we will be back next week with uh, Margie Prius to talk about her book, Village of Scoundrels, along with a special guest, uh, Nellie Hewitt, who lived in the titular Village of Scoundrels in the Second World War, which should be fascinating. Um, and, 
And <laughs> do you know these couple of people I know? This is wonderful. Yeah, yeah everybody. I, I like oh, just to ramble here a bit so that we can watch the watch the thank yous roll a bit. Um, and and will the the friends of the St. Paul Public Library uh, in in will be back in touch with with Carolyn and her fellow memoir and creative nonfiction writers for a Meet the Finalists panel later in the spring. Um, so do keep an eye on our YouTube for that. It'll be great. I loved these panels last year. It was a fantastic discovery of pandemic era programming that <laughs> we could get fuller length meet the finalist panels and everybody could talk a bit more about their work. So that was great. Wow. I'm really looking forward to it. And thank all of you for coming again and thank, oh, Ronnie Brooks, too high, Ronnie. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> thanks, Wendy, again. I just, oh, some names are coming up and some aren't, but oh my gosh, this is wonderful. Okay, I'll shut up. It's no, 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 it's it's fine. I'm yeah, I I've enjoyed I've enjoyed this and I wish you all a, a very good night. And again, if you want to pick up uh, Carolyn's book, we do have a partnership with Next Chapter Booksellers for for the uh, duration of Fireside. They've got a special page up for us. You can find the books there or at your library, of course. <laughs> have a good night, everyone. Yes. Have a good night, everyone. And thank you. I've got to go have my red wine now. Do go enjoy. <laughs>